Malaya, 1951. The British High Commissioner Sir Henry Gurney has been assassinated. That year alone has seen over 6,000 attacks and civilian casualties have risen to over 1,800. Harold Briggs, architect of the Briggs plan, leaves Malaya, ill and disillusioned. The war on communist terror is in crisis. But the British cannot afford to lose face. They must hunt down Gurney's assassins and bring them to justice. Attention immediately focuses on the Chinese town of Truss, just 30 kilometers from Fraser's Hill, where Gurney was killed. Truss already has a bad reputation. Many skirmishes have been fought with communists in the town or nearby. You always felt that Truss was hostile. Um, uh, it's, it struck me that not only the, the men and women, but uh, even the children, something, even the dogs, looked at me in a hostile way when I went through Truss. Then, British police intercept a communist courier with a cache of letters. They turn out to be messages sent to Truss residents by the gang that killed Gurney. It looks like the smoking gun. So a decision is made to punish Truss. All 2,000 inhabitants will be moved to a detention camp. British security forces descend on the town. The people of Truss will not return to their homes for seven long years. The punishment of Truss is a turning point. It signals a new, more aggressive phase of the British War on Terror. The driving force is the new British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. He understands that the Malayan crisis is a key front in the global struggle against communism. Churchill demands a ruthless response and warns, what happens in Malaya will have a profound influence on the rest of the world. A replacement must be found for Gurney and the new High Commissioner must possess the talent and resolution to smash the communist threat once and for all. Churchill appoints a tough-minded veteran of the Second World War, Sir Gerald Templer. He thought that I was the right person for the job. In a way, he'd take a chance on me, and uh, that he wanted me to sort the business as quick as possible. Templer has no previous Asian experience, but he is widely admired as an original strategic thinker, a human dynamo with a fondness for right language. Churchill fuses the role of High Commissioner and Director of Operations, giving Templar decisive new powers, the right tools for a hard job. He will be the Supremo, a virtual dictator. He was a man who controlled everything. He was a generalissimo dictator, and um, he knew his part and played it very well. Templar knows that force will not be enough to beat the communist. He must win Malayan hearts and minds, a phrase made famous during the emergency. In Malaya, General Templar ensured there was this top-down strategic coordination. Everyone had to sing from the same song sheet. The song sheet title was, Government is your friend. Templar's skills as a political soldier will prove vital, for he has been given another brief, to prepare Malaya for self-governance. Britain was prepared to give Malaya self-government within a few years' time. So Templar's role was to create the conditions for self-government, setting into foundation a, a structure that would eventually lead to the formation of uh, strong Malayan uh, political parties. But first, Chin Peng's communists must be defeated 
and Templar's metal is tested just weeks after his arrival. On the 24th of March, 1952, a British repair party arrives at Tanjung Malim to mend a water pipeline sabotaged by communist terrorists. The repair party is accompanied by 15 policemen. No one expects any trouble. But a trap has been set, as a policeman recalls. The communist ambush kills 14 men and wounds eight. Only one man escapes. Templar decides to show what he is made of. He will crack down hard. He arrives in Tanjung Malim and orders 350 Malay, Chinese and Indian leaders in the district to assemble in the town hall. He demands to know the identity of the killers. The response? Silence. <laughs> Templar doesn't hesitate. The people of Tanjung Malim must be punished. He announces a curfew and food rationing. The rice ration is cut to less than half. He says, it doesn't amuse me to punish innocent people, but many of you are not innocent. You have information which you are too cowardly to give. The, the curfew was 22 hours. The, the people can only go out between 12 and 2. It was a very drastic measure. Two weeks later, Templar orders stage two. The British distribute leaflets demanding information about local communists. Every adult must complete a form detailing everything they know. The completed, unsigned documents are collected in sealed boxes and sent directly to Templar's headquarters. For the new High Commissioner, the results are most gratifying. A rich trove of information spills from the open boxes. A few days later, the police return. Forty arrests are made. Tanjung Malim has been well and truly purged. Templar's decisive action galvanizes the war on terror. Soon, the new High Commissioner is everywhere, talking, listening, and above all, taking action. He made it a point to go around visiting villages, estates, in a fully armed motorcade. He was in, engaged in a political campaign to win hearts and minds of the people to assure them the governance worked on the ground. Templar's new shape-up or ship-out strategy spares no one. He started, to our great pleasure, um, getting hold of people who were not playing their part in the emergency. They suddenly disappeared overnight, and um, after about three months, we suddenly realised he'd, he'd cleaned the place up. It was absolutely marvellous. Morale came back, and he became our leader in, in, in fact, as, as well as position. Templar electrified the administration and he projected confidence as somebody who was a no-nonsense guy. People were, a lot of people were terrified of him. But Templar's hearts and minds campaign will remain empty rhetoric unless there is political reform. The reason is that more than a million Chinese and Indians do not possess the basic right of citizenship, even those fighting on the front line of the war, like Yun Yuet Ling. I was born here, but I never had citizenship here. And if the British went, I don't know where I would go, frankly. In September 1952, the Malay sultans agree to extend citizenship to Chinese and Indian residents. 
For Yun and other Chinese Malayans, Templar's gift of citizenship meant everything. That had very, very positive impact on the Chinese population. The capstone in Templar's Hearts and Minds master plan is to launch a public relations campaign, Operation Service, demonstrating that the police are public servants dedicated to protecting law-abiding Malayans of all races. Ready to serve, that was the slogan of the police and operation service. The whole idea being build a relationship with the population. National morale perceptibly rises. There is a new sense of purpose and greater confidence in the government. But the campaign against Chin Peng's jungle army has not been won. Templar realizes that the war on terror is handicapped by one factor above all, poor intelligence. We had not grasped the fact that you cannot do a jungle war without intelligence. So Templar sets about reforming Malaya's inept special branch so that it can become the vanguard in the war on terror. <laughs>